today we want to continue in our study in Acts. And I gave a lot of thought to this title. Uh, the title is Best Church Business Meeting Ever. Said no one ever. <laughs> But I think if you'd have been at this one, you might have had a different opinion. Because they came together, they had a concern, they had an issue, they had to address it. There was proposal, there was a solution uh, suggested, and they, get the, they were in agreement. So, you know, really, we could almost just say that's the sermon for today. But I think we might want to drill down into it just a little bit. But it is amazing in those early days, and with all of these different kind of people, different backgrounds, different culture, different language, how they were able to still be united in all they did. So Acts chapter 6, verses 1 through 7. In those days, as the disciples were increasing in number, there arose a complaint by the Hellenistic Jews against the Hebraic Jews that their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution. The twelve summoned the whole company of the disciples and said, it would not be right for us to give up preaching the word of God to wait on tables. Brothers and sisters, select from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the spirit and wisdom, whom we can appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. This proposal pleased the whole company. So they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit, and Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas, a convert from Antioch. They had them stand before the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. So the word of God spread. The disciples in Jerusalem increased greatly in number, and a large group of priests became obedient to the faith. Father, thank you for your word. We thank you for the encouragement that we find here. Father, we thank you for uh, really all that Jesus came to uh, seek to uh, prepare and then uh, to provide for us and to establish uh, is the body of Christ we see being lived out in these six verses. And so, Lord, I pray that you'll help us to surrender the time to be here. I pray for your messenger, Father, that I would be surrendered to the leadership of your Holy Spirit, saying uh, what it is that you want to have said here. Then, Father, give us the hearts we need to be able to truly hear this word, receive it, and adjust our lives, align our lives with it, that we could bring glory and honor to you in all that we do. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. As we've been walking through Acts, we hit a transition here in chapter 6. The first five chapters of Acts provides a picture of how the early church began to implement Jesus' command from Acts 1.8. That is, you will be my witnesses in Judea, Samaria, or Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, I knew I missed one, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. In the next few chapters, we're going to see the second step in carrying out, probably chapters 6 through 12, uh, carrying out the Great Commission, focusing in primarily on Judea and Samaria. They've uh, got the gospel in Jerusalem. Now they're going to start going to Jerusalem and, I mean, excuse me, Judea and Samaria. And then the final chapters, 13 through 28, tell the story of Paul's ministry and where he takes it, the ministry, as is often said, that his ministry to the Gentiles Paul now showing us how the Great Commission is being carried to the ends of the earth. Now, if you just step back and pause for a moment and reflect on that, isn't it kind of, it's just, it's amazing to me. This is what Jesus said to go do. Then he sends the power of the Holy Spirit, the promise to do it, and they just start doing it. And then we see it done. Uh, And yet, sometimes I wonder if we just make it harder than what it is to get this accomplished. And, and let me back that truck up, and I think I've said this a couple of weeks ago. Uh, you know, people think that we can fulfill the Great Commission and that Jesus is going to come. Well, one, I think the Great Commission has been fulfilled. I think the, the word has, been, is, has literally been all around the globe. I doubt that there's a place that hasn't heard it in some way or another. Now, we know there's some language groups and people groups that we call unreached people groups and the way that we define that is that less, if there's less than 1% of them who uh, claim to be a follower of Christ, we would say they're an unreached people group. And so that just means we need to send missionaries there, we need to send the gospel there, but it's not to say the Great Commission uh, hasn't been fulfilled. Or I could say it another way, the Great Commission will never be fulfilled. I mean, it's saying the same thing. It, we are, until Jesus comes back, we are to go to Jerusalem, our area, Judea, that'd be like... Ohio, Samaria, be like the United States, 
and then the ends of the earth. That'd be like West Virginia. I just wanted to see if you guys are with me. My mom's from West Virginia. I'm allowed to make West Virginia jokes, okay? So it is, it is our marching orders from now until the time Jesus comes back. It's to carry out the Great Commission. There's all this talk about trying to finish it and fulfill it and end it. Uh, we just need to get over that and just realize that's what we're supposed to be doing. And we do those simultaneously as we carry out the gospel. These chapters, uh, chapters 6 through 8, become a transitional chapter that helps us to see where the uh, new uh, body of believers, the followers who are going to be known uh, eventually as Christians, they are breaking from their Jewish heritage and tradition. Now, not completely, and there's still a lot of things, and you're going to see a lot of struggles with this along the way, but Paul is going to be one of the leading ones to help really get it there. It's the story here that is, as one writer says, it's the story is more than a story of a geographical spread of Christianity. It's the story of the gospel becoming a universal gospel, breaking the racial, national, and religious barriers in which it was born and carrying out a worldwide witness. We are reminded in these chapters that the early church embraced the Great Commission and the beginnings of how life is to be lived in the kingdom of God. And we're going to see this, and I'll make this side note here. Uh, we see the barriers being broken that when this problem arises in this new community of believers, this new fellowship of believers, uh, the apostles call everybody together. They summon them together, and they say, brothers and sisters jews prior to this it would have been brothers all right we're starting to see where jesus said there's neither male nor female jew nor greek slave nor free we are all one in christ and that's where we start to see this break we start to see them going okay this is what jesus taught us now we know we're still practicing a lot of these traditions but we know that what we need to do is take what Jesus has taught, teach it daily, proclaim it, and then allow it to shape exactly what it is that he wants to shape. In these verses today, we're reminded of one of the mandates, and so we're just going to take a section of that today. We're going to get a little snapshot of this transition as it begins, but we're all going to also going to see where the emphasis is on everybody is equal, that there's one mandate that kind of rose up in that early group, that early church that established, and that was that there would be no needy person among them. And it's going to stay. And that's something that they're really going to, uh, uh, throughout the whole story of, uh, of the church, has been something that is, it, it needs to be uh, taught, it needs to be embraced, and it needs to be among us. Uh, that, as uh, Carol was talking about earlier, this is, our family and we can rely upon our family and we can embrace our family and know that I have no need that cannot be met Now, sometimes what we have to do is we have to humble ourselves you know to be able to come and ask but we have any problem asking when we're um, sick right pray for me but where we have problems is, is when I've been building a chicken coop for three months and I don't go ask for help you know I need to humble myself and ask people to come help me build my chicken coop all right, I'm not, I've lost you. I'm going to have to go back to the West Virginia stories. Really, it's, it's a silly thing, right? But the truth of the matter is, we try to do, we're so stinking independent in the United States that we don't want to rely on other people. We want to do it. We think we can accomplish it. And I think that's good. I think we ought to push ourselves, but we need to know we're part of a greater whole. And we really do need each other at times. I mean, we couldn't do this. I couldn't do the tech stuff. I couldn't do the music stuff. We couldn't, we couldn't function as a church. We have folks that come in and prepare the communion each week. You know, we all work together, and we need each other, and we should be able to come to one another and say, hey, I need your help. One of the things that they learned as an early church that as they grew, the way that they administrated the church, the way that they carried things out, the way that they met people's needs was going to become difficult. You know, more people met more needs, and so they had to figure out a way that they were going to make sure that they kept this mandate, that there would be no needy person among them. And yet what we saw and what we read in the scriptures is that inadvertently, some people were being overlooked. And so the apostles got together, and, they, and I'm sure they prayed about it, they talked about it, and what they felt like they needed to do was call the whole assembly back. And they are going to propose a suggestion. But I want to lay the foundation for that. I wonder, now this is, just, this is Steve Long at this point, right? 
wondering, did the apostles think back to a story that they would have heard from one of their patriarchs, Moses, and the involvement of his father-in-law, Jethro? You know, as Moses led the people out of Egypt and into the wilderness, uh, we're talking, you know, sometimes we tend to think this was like a small band of people, probably a couple million folks uh, by the time, because they only counted the men back then. And when you take those numbers, kind of multiply them, we don't know for sure, but there was a large group that was wandering through the desert, and he's leading them. And the story that you find in uh, Exodus 18 is where Moses is sitting daily, and the people are bringing their complaints. Now, you can imagine when you gather that many people together, they're traveling together. Uh, have you ever traveled with folks? Uh, you know, mission trips even. You know, after a few days, you're like, hey, you going to pick that towel up? I am not your mother. I'm not doing your dishes, right? That kind of thing. Not that moms have to do dishes. I do dishes too. I'm going to cover myself here. But it, 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 you, there, there can be these irritations. And so it could be everything from pretty serious like theft or murder or abuse of some kind to where they ran, their goat ran through my tent and broke our, our, you know, our pots. And they're bringing all of these concerns to Moses. And he's standing there as the one who is to hear them and then to administer justice. And Jethro's looking at this and he says, that's not good. And if you pick the story up in, in Exodus 18, chapter, or chapter 18, verse 13, he said, The next day Moses sat down to judge the people, and they stood around Moses from morning until evening. When Moses' father-in-law saw everything he was doing for them, he asked, What is this you're doing for the people? Why are you alone sitting as judge while all these people stand around you from morning until evening? Moses replied to his father-in-law, Because the people come to me to inquire of God. Whenever they have a dispute, it comes to me, and I make a decision between one man and another. I teach them God's statutes and laws. Jethro replies, what you are doing is not good. Now, how do you say that's not good, teaching them statutes and laws and, and helping uh, parse out judgment? But here what, here's his point. Moses' father-in-law, uh, uh, verse 18, excuse me, you will certainly wear out both yourself and these people who are with you. The task is too heavy for you. You cannot do it alone. Now listen to me. I will give you some advice, and God be with you. You be the one to represent the people before God and bring their cases to him. Instruct them about the statutes and laws and teach them the way to live and what they must do. Proclamation of the word and prayer. This is what Moses was doing. This is what the apostles are going to suggest. Verse 21, but you should select from the people of able men God-fearing, trustworthy, and hating dishonest prophet, full of the spirit and wisdom, right? And place them over the people as commanders of thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. They should judge the people at all times. Then they can bring you every major case, but judge every minor case themselves. In this way, you will lighten your load, and they will bear it with you. I love that. They will bear it with you. We bear these loads together. Jethro says, if you do this, and God so directs you, you will be able to endure, and also the people with you will be able to go home satisfied. You know, the statistic is one uh, out of three uh, men that enter, or people that enter the ministry will finish well, that will finish it all. That, you know, two out of those three are going to completely drop out. And most of the reasons, and one of the things that we have discovered along the way, it's due to burnout and frustration and just being completely tired. And the people get to that place too. That's why it's important for us to raise up leaders. That's why it's important for us to realize not one person is more important than the other. We've got to carry and bear this heavy burden, this load together. Moses listened to his father-in-law and he raised up leaders. He raised up those to help him with the administration needs of Jerusalem and it satisfied the people. It met their needs. I mean, think about it. You're the guy in line that's going to bring a charge against your neighbor because the goat ran through your tent. You're standing there for three, four hours just to be able to present your case. You know, there's where, it's where frustration starts to build up. But here what we see is that because of, of being able to be trusting of others, recognizing that others are also called by God, and that all of us can be filled with wisdom and full of the Holy Spirit, we can serve in this capacity so this heavy load doesn't come to to be too much for one person to bear we bear it together 
So let's bring that all the way back to our issue today that we read about in 6. The problem was this, as simple as this. Verse 1, the church was growing. There were Jews from all around the world that were accepting Christ. They were joining this early movement. The groups of people that came, and remember, they came from all over the world. They came to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. These are Jews from all the world. These are probably Jews that, that were dispersed. The diaspora is what we would call them. And, and as, they, as they came, they settled there. They, uh, they celebrated uh, Passover, and then they uh, experienced Pentecost, and they stayed. They knew there was this new movement that needed to be a part of. And when they stayed, it was natural for them to kind of gather by uh, their own culture and language, because they're all coming with different cultures, different backgrounds, different traditions, different languages. But even though they, they, they would uh, camp together, they would stay in homes together, they would stay in communities based on their language and culture, they still saw themselves as one body. If they didn't, this issue with the Hellenistic widows would have only come up in the community of the Greeks that had gathered there. But they brought it to the apostles. They knew that we needed to take care of this or they needed to take care of this issue together. And the simple issue was this, the, the widows... And if you're a widow in that day, you, you were in a tough spot, especially if you didn't have any other family to help take care of you. You relied on the assistance of other people. You relied on them to help meet your daily needs. These re- widows required assistance of others to have their daily needs met. But somewhere along the line, the widows were being overlooked in what they say the daily distribution of food. Now, how could that happen? I don't know. Here's what I do know. You've got 3,000 people that joined that first day. They're adding to their numbers daily. I don't know how big this place is or how much and how spread out it is and how they're carrying out the distribution, but I can see where it is possible. If you didn't have a representative from your family standing up for you, that you could be overlooked. I don't think anybody's upset here. I think what they're doing is saying, hey, this has happened. This is what's taking place. We need to fix it. Now, there, there was a pattern that the early church used for distribution, and it was patterned after the Jewish custom of tr- distribution. Now, I'm only mentioning this because what I, I want to say is while we're breaking from those Jewish traditions, they're hanging on to some, and not all of them are bad. Sometimes we want to say about traditions that uh, we, just, we just need to get over them. Not all traditions are bad. You know, the, if you have a tradition that the uh, carpet in the church can only be Uh, blue I guess I'll go with that that's bad that's just being so narrow minded but there are some that are good Uh, you know things like celebrating Advent and Lent and all of those things these are good things that help bring us back and center us in on the person of Christ and so I I mentioned that but the way that they were doing and and so they weren't doing this just haphazardly the way that they were distributing this food I mean they at least had a plan and there were two ways that they would distribute the food the first one was called Tamue uh, and it is the daily distribution of bread. This means that they had a time where uh, people could uh, count on the fact that, that uh, food was going to be provided and, and, and served to them or at least brought to them. It was daily. Uh, if you had a need uh, based on the day you could go. But the second was that they were using was called quipa. And this referred to a weekly supply of food. And it's interesting, that's how they define it, a weekly supply of food that lasts for 14 days. I don't know, maybe their calendar was different. <laughs> but I think and that's two weeks for us, right? Actually, in our house, it would probably be the month, you know, the, <laughs> the way that we eat. But it, it is, uh, uh, they made sure that people had a way, had a means of getting the food that they needed. The problem is, again, the widows who couldn't go on their own because of, that was culturally wrong for them to do, someone had to represent them if they were overlooked because they had no family member or anyone taking and caring for them, they were missed. Even though this was being offered daily, even though they could get these 14-day supplies, somehow, some way, the widows were inadvertently overlooked. And I believe they were inadvertently overlooked because of the way that the response that the apostles uh, 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 dealt with this. The apostles came together and said, yes, this is serious. We need to deal with it. And so the 12 summoned the Christian community together to propose a solution. And the solution was pretty simple, really. And that's the other thing I like about this. Don't have to overthink it. Just need to figure out how we're going to raise up leaders just like Jethro and Moses uh, did to be able to carry this out. 
you find this in verses 2 through 4, a proposed solution. The apostles stated that they should not give up the ministry of preaching and praying to wait on the tables, to wait on tables. Now, I'll tell you what, I've worked with a lot of pastors over the years, and they like to go to this verse. You know, I, my job is the ministry of proclaiming and, and, uh, and prayer. I'm to equip the people for the work. We so misunderstand that. We equip each other. And that is one of my roles, is to equip you for the work of the kingdom. That doesn't uh, uh, exempt me from work in the kingdom. That doesn't exempt me from coming shoulder to shoulder with you, hand in hand with you, and serving together with you in the kingdom. Too many like to lead from the pulpit. We can't lead from the pulpit. We need to lead from the floor. We need to lead by serving and working together. And we might uh, think that of the apostles, that they felt like waiting on tables was beneath them. I don't believe that's the case at all here. One, because I see the evidence of their life and what they do and, 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 and what they go on to do. I believe if you hear the words, they simply said it would not be good for us to do that. So when I hear that it would not be good for us to do that, they're not saying I wouldn't do that. They're saying we'll take care of it if we need to. But the problem is we've been given the charge of uh, leading this new uh, movement of faith. We're, we've been given charge to lead this new church. And we have to do that by going out and proclaiming and teaching. And certainly we can, under, and please catch this, they knew they could not do that without staying and spending significant time in prayer. Intimacy with the Father is absolutely key in all that we do. We need to spend time with him. And they knew that if they took and took this role on of distributing the food, that was going to take away time for them to be able to go out and continue to evangelize, to speak in the, at the temple and to do the other things that they were doing. And certainly was going to interfere with their time of spending alone with the Lord. And so not that they wouldn't do it, but they knew that it was a task that uh, uh, would uh, keep them from being able to move this movement forward and be faithful to it as God had called them to. So I think following the pattern of Jethro's advice, now we're not told that, we're not told that, that's, that's me, I, I'm doing, my, my theology professors right now are just going, oh, because <laughs> I'm just reading into the text here, I'm applying something, but I think it that's probably works here, it probably is true, that the, uh, they knew that they needed to raise up people so that this would not become an, uh, a problem that would eventually even possibly split the new movement or hurt the new movement. And so the apostles asked the community to come together, and they simply said, select seven men of good reputation, full of faith and wisdom. So the qualifications was that, one, the apostles weren't going to pick them. They wanted the body to pick them because those in the body knew the men in their various communities, their various neighborhoods. Think about it. They, they didn't just come to church like we do here and we're all together in one building. I mean, they are living spread out all over Jerusalem and the area. And, the, and those groups that are spread out, they're meeting daily with each other. And so they know one another, and they know who God is growing up, who God is maturing, and the apostles knew that. And so the apostles asked them. And it's also then this group saying, here's who we want to lead us. Here's, this is who we want to serve us because we believe, one, they have a great reputation, that they're full of faith, and they have wisdom. I call this spiritual authority. Spiritual authority can only be established in one way. It comes from the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. I can't tell you I have spiritual authority. You can't tell me you have spiritual authority. I, uh, Billy Graham, if he was here, wouldn't be able to tell me he has spiritual authority. In fact, if Billy Graham was here, he would not tell me he has spiritual authority because he, I believe, understands what that means. Spiritual authority comes from the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. It's not based on our position. It's not based on our status. It's not based on a title. Rather, it's a recognition by others of the manifestation of the Spirit in a person's life. And people see that and they gravitate to it. And to be honest with you, it's never really spoken of. The one who has spiritual authority doesn't bring it up. Those who say, that's the person, one, I aspire to be like, and that that's who I want to help me and to gain insight and uh, advice and to help me to grow and become the person I need to be. When they do that, that's when spiritual authority is taking place. 
And so they chose these. In fact, verses 5 to 6, the community came together. They heard the proposal from uh, the apostles, and they gathered back together in their groups, and then they brought back uh, the ones that they wanted to lead. The people embraced this proposal. It says in the script, the proposal pleased the people. Now, we need to be careful here because we're not doing everything just to please you. And sometimes we have to do some things that are uncomfortable. In fact, we have to be uncomfortable in order for us to grow individually and to grow as a church. What we need to understand, the way that this, this would be better understood, is the people were in agreement with this proposal. This seemed right. This seemed like the next step. This seemed like this is what we ought to do. And so they came, they embraced it, and they carried out the proposal. And they chose Stephen. And believe it or not, I'm going to try to say these names again. Uh, a man full of faith in the Holy Spirit. Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenius, and Nicholas, a convert from Antioch. These men were able to be identified by the uh, community of faith, and they brought these men before the apostles. And I also think we need to catch here just a little nuance. They brought them back. They didn't just go out and chose them and said, this is your task, now go do it. They brought them back to the apostles. The whole community came back together, and they said, here's who we believe uh, ought to lead us. And the apostles do something incredible. They, they laid their hands on them so that they would, and prayed for them, and then sent them out to lead and empowered them and gave them the ability to serve as they needed to serve. The reason they brought him back and the reason the apostles laid hands on him is this was to bear witness to the community that these men were to carry out the responsibility of making uh, sure that there were no needs overlooked. No needs overlooked. A lot of times folks want to go to this chapter and, I, and passage, and I've done it myself, uh, to talk about qualifications for deacons. Uh, the word is not even found in the book of Acts, but we can certainly find a pattern. We can find... A, uh, how uh, we ought to serve in those roles as deacons and servants in the church. By the way, if you ever wonder if you're a servant or not, here's a good test. If it bothers you to serve, you're not. We look for the opportunities to serve. We get excited. when. Now, listen, there's times, right? We, we, we crush with time. Um, we get colds. Um, you know, we just can't do these kind of things. But we, it's not because we, we are upset about serving. It's because there's a lot of pressure around it sometimes. Don't be bothered by serving. We're all called to serve. We're all called to go. And, and by the way, the, the uh, um, translation for that word deacon, diakona, is simply sweeping through the dust. We tend to think sometimes that these folks come in and serve. They're, the, they're now the leaders, the bosses of the church. No, they are servants. I'm a servant, Alan's a servant, Chuck's a servant, Rick's a servant. We're all servants. Now, I realize he's got to serve in his elders, not deacons, and I, we're not going to get into that whole process and system this morning. But what I am saying is that it sets the pattern for us of how we ought to respond. And then when we see that, it is important for us to recognize, and it is for us important for us as a community to come back and recognize these people are set apart for that. And I wouldn't care if it was uh, me serving as pastor or you serving as a Sunday school teacher or a children's worker, uh, as an elder, as a greeter out in the hall. Whatever it is, we need to recognize God has raised this person up to participate in that, to help us carry and, and, and bear the heavy burden. And we should celebrate that, Right? Wouldn't it be fun if we start seeing, you know, wh what it is we're all doing and we recognize it and then we support them in that. This, this is more than just a commissioning service. It is one that is saying we recognize this is what the work of God in your life. He wants you to carry this out. He wants you to do it. And we are behind you 100%. That's what was taking place. And we really don't have to say much more about this other than verse 7, the results. So when the body comes together under the leadership of those who are leading by the leadership of the Holy Spirit and they deal with an issue and they come to the solution and they embrace the solution and they carry out the solution, the result is going to be this. The word of God spread. The disciples in Jerusalem increased greatly in number and a large group of priests became obedient to the faith. The word grows 
when it is faithfully proclaimed and falls on fertile soil. Back to that idea. Our responsibility is this, make sure we're fertile soil. That means we're spending time with the Father, we're spending time in prayer, we're spending time in his word, we're growing and maturing as a believer so that when we come together as a body, we come together as a healthy body, one in spirit, one in mind. You know, the mention of the priest here, I believe, speaks to the power of the gospel when it's lived out with authenticity and surrender. These priests were probably... uh, like uh, you would consider them like local priests, and, and most of them would have been poor. There's estimates that there were probably about 8,000 in Jerusalem that day. But these were, these were men that were committed to the Jewish faith, tradition, way. And, and, and they saw what was happening in this new movement. And because they knew the scripture, because they knew the story of God, because they taught the story of God day in and day out, over and over and over again, they now recognize, unlike the Sanhedrin who couldn't get over themselves, you know, the Sadducees and the Pharisees, they just wanted to keep their status, they wanted to keep their power. The priest here said, ah, this is it. This is what we've been waiting for. Here's the kingdom of God. I think that's why Luke kind of gives that to us. And he helps us to understand that even these types can be one if we will authentically live out our faith, if we will authentically live out and surrender to the Holy Spirit. Surrender to the leading of the Holy Spirit It will result in your life being transformed and it will result in the lives of those around you being transformed. And that's what we're called to do in this great commission. Live transformed and lead others to be transformed. It's not any harder than that. But let's give ourselves to preparing ourselves to be fertile soil by spending time in word, in the prayer, and seeking God in all that we do. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for its teaching and understanding. I pray, Father, that we will commit ourselves to being a people who seek after you, to grow in spiritual authority even though we know we're, we're not growing in it, to not be aware of the work that you're doing in and through us, to have others recognize it so that we can serve them, not, not that we're drawing crowds or not that we're drawing people or not that we're becoming popular, but that we're serving them and that's why people come is because we just simply love them, care about them, and we want to introduce them to Jesus, the one who can change their life forever. Father, may we commit our lives to that. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.